And that brings us to the start of our webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with the most important part. Welcome, everyone. I'm Richie Brayman, and I'm with the University of Georgia's Center for Urban Agriculture. The center supports this webinar technology from UGA Extension. I would like to introduce you to the host of this webinar series. Dr. Bodhi Panisi is a professor of landscape horticulture in the Department of Horticulture at the University of Georgia. She's located on the UGA Griffin campus. Dr. Panisi has worked with the landscape industry since the year 2000. Bodhi would like to welcome you and introduce you to our first speaker today. Thank you, Richie, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in the first of the 2019 webinars on this lovely and cool uh, January morning. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Bob Polomsky. He's an extension specialist with the Department of Plant and Environmental Sciences at Clemson University. He's a horticulturist and an adjunct assistant professor. He's an award-winning horticulturist and an ISA and track certified arborist with teaching extension and research responsibilities. Bob teaches three undergraduate courses, landscape plants, urban tree care, and selected topics in urban forestry. Since September of 2011, he has been the advisor for the urban forestry minor. With a broad interest in all things plants, Bob's present horticultural arboricultural pursuits include the study of urban tree growth and management and identifying, evaluating, and promoting plants that provide aesthetic and ecological benefits to landscapes and streetscapes. Bob also serves on the marketing committee of Niche, the National Initiative for Consumer Horticulture, a broad-based coalition of industry and academia with a goal to grow in health, a healthy world through plants, gardens, and landscapes. Welcome, Bob. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Panisi, and welcome to this webinar. I, I've got uh, two amazing people that have supported me here, Dr. Panisi, of course, and Richie Brayman, who is an expert in all things computers. I just had a question for you guys once again, uh, Dr. Panisi. I have until, is it 9.15? No, you have until 9.25. Perfect. Okay. Well, my friends, I have a number of slides I wanted to share with you, and I am really partial to this topic about the importance of arborists in educating consumers. And as I go through this presentation, uh, let me just see if I could move. Uh, I wanted to move my control panel so I can see something here. There. Okay. So. I really feel, and as you, as I go through this presentation, the importance of educating people about pruning, which is both an art and a science, and it is something that re really requires experience and knowledge. And so originally when I gave this title to Dr. Panisi, I just focused on the science, but, um, oh boy, let's see, I'm trying to advance. Here we go. Uh, I wanted to mention the artistic aspects of pruning as well. And so as we go through this presentation, I'm going to be covering the artistic side, but also reminding everyone about the importance of the scientific aspects of pruning and the importance of sharing that information with your customers. And so what I typically like to do when I'm in front of an industry audience like yourselves is for you to read this slide. Now, if you're Spanish, of course, you could read the second line. If you're Polish, yes, them studentum, that's great. But all of you who are tuning in today, you are lifelong learners. And you should be proud of that fact. And it's really critical for your customers to know that you are constantly learning and improving your game. And in this situation, I hope I can provide you with, with some elements uh, that, that will help you in sharing this pruning message with your customers. And I'd be remiss if I did not include this line from, Doc, uh, from uh, Sir Isaac Newton uh, about 
how I have relied on the work and I've been standing on the shoulders of giants. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Mickey Taylor, I will say this unequivocally that without him, I would never have completed my dissertation, which I started in my late 40s. So Mickey, I want to thank you so much for being there for me. And also, I need to do this for Dr. Panisi's sake, I suppose, where I have to put this disclaimer in here, and I have tried to eliminate some commercial products, but I am not endorsing any of them. And so, as I said at the top of this webinar, pruning is an art form. And so I still remember in the early 90s, driving down um, in Colombia, and to the right, my children saw the golden arches. And what I saw were these beautiful ligustrums that were, were pruned into what I refer to as hamburgers on a stick. And I just thought how clever that is to tie in the, the golden arches for the children and the hamburgers on a stick for guys like me. But we also have to remember that whenever we prune plants, it is a wounding process. And there is science behind uh, our pruning approaches. And so understanding the importance of these overlapping branch layers, I mean, sorry, the trunk layers overlapping the branch, the branches, understanding the, the, the importance of the branch collar and that branch uh, protection zone are critical aspects of pruning, which we'll get to shortly. And so with regard to pruning, there are a number of systems that are available to us. And I wanted to share one system, and this is what, what's termed in the ANSI standards is the natural system. We are essentially looking at a pyramidal shaped tree with a central leader with branches growing radially that are fairly well spaced apart on the trunk. This is what we would like to see in our open grown trees, whether they are in a commercial site or a residential site. And then we've got what I would call more intensive pruning. And once again, re re relying on those standards, the espalier, topiary, which is in the lower right hand corner, I guess that might be a Scottish Terrier. And then we've got pleaching. You can see that in the lower right hand corner. We've got branches that are grafted together to produce that beautiful archway. And of course, pollarding, another technique that has been used by Europeans for centuries. It has this architectural look about it. And so when I look and go visit gardens like Longwood Gardens, and I see this espalier, this is attractive to people that visit sites like this. Go to the Atlanta Botanical Garden and see the beautiful fruit trees. There are also espaliered, it's called a, pl a plenary approach. You grow it in a plane alongside a vertical structure like that. And then of course with pleaching, all of this is intensive pruning. And with this particular archway, you could go inside of this, which is really cool. And you could, and these branches are woven together to create this beautiful lattice work of branches. Now, for some of you who are really interested in pruning and maybe selling to clients who would like to create this natural playground for, for their children or even for their adults, you know, think about using pleaching, uh, adding that to your wheelhouse. And of course, with the topiary. I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about topiary because of its importance in the realm of pruning. This is high end, high maintenance pruning. That's that uh, I took these shots over in Bishopville, South Carolina. And by just looking at this topiary work of a number of conifers, I know who had done this. It's Pearl Fryer. This is a wonderful crepe myrtle that has been pleached and twisted into this beautiful heart shape. But if you go to Bishopville, you need to visit Pearl Friar's Topiary Garden. And this is an extraordinary place where it seems like he breaks all the rules of horticulture to create these beautiful designs. But obviously he has to follow the rules, especially when it comes to conifers, being mindful of the particular conifer, knowing that if you prune into wood that has no foliage, you will not expect any regrowth. I looked at these quotes on his website, and this is kind of interesting where with his particular quote here, he wasn't aware of any of his limitations and he figured he could do whatever he wanted to with plants. You ever get the impression that sometimes your customers feel the same way, but they don't achieve those same results. 
And then this one kind of bothered me a little bit where his approach, he, he had worked in a, uh, a metal factory. And so he has, he looks at topiary with plants as nothing different than working with wood or metal. And here's where I just happen to have to disagree because we know that any interaction we have with plants creates a response and a variation of Newton's third law of physics where with for every uh, action or pruning action, we get some response from that action. And it's important that we're mindful of that. It's also important to know that pruning is not this, this organic, intuitive process. And all of you know who are watching this webinar, you know, this is not what you do. This, this is just... I would almost I'd be bold to say that this, this is a total disrespect of these trees doing something like this. And so when I see people across from my, my backyard and seeing my neighbor's mulberry being topped by this fellow, how is this guy working? Is it from the gut? It should not be from the gut. Pruning is an intellectual exercise. It's just not when the client says that this mulberry is growing too tall, it is growing over my neighbor's boundary, you just don't top these plants. And so now that takes me to the customer. So this customer sees all of this work around them. And I really feel that after 25 years of working with consumers, I understand that many of them, they perform the act of shearing because it is the easiest thing to do. And when I look at this situation of my neighbor across the street, the necessity here is she has a 15, she has a Burford holly that wants to grow 15 to 20 feet tall. It was planted in front of her windows. So she is obligated, if she wants to see out those windows, to reduce the height of those Burford hollies. And what's really tragic is when the ladder comes out. And then you know as professionals that pruning should be done with both feet on the ground if you are a customer and professionals who have the experience and the training, they are the ones who should be able to go vertical with this. And so I was just really astounded that this poor woman is dealing with these shrubs planted right next to her home and in order to see through those windows, she has to perform this practice. And so the reasons for her pruning are strictly, I would say, uh, for utilitarian purpose. I wanna see through these windows. I need to suppress their height. I need to take action. I was watching her. Okay, I'm from my driveway. I, I knew if anything would go wrong, I'd be there for her. But when I look at something like this, I can imagine all those people doing this kind of do-it-yourself pruning and not being really aware of, of why they're doing this. And so for these consumer audiences, I developed this list, what I call the four T's, where when it comes to pruning shrubs and trees, you do have to use the, the, the right technique, use the right tools for the job, of course, prune at the appropriate time of year. And the real biggie is, I think, I feel is the missing piece in all of this, is thinking about what you're doing prior to doing it. And that's where the importance of knowledge comes in with regard to pruning shrubs and trees properly and being able to share that information with your clients. I've got a few aphorisms that I'm throwing your way. Here's another one of those. And quoting Dr. Shigo, that yes, pruning can be one of the best things we do for our plants, but at the same time, it can be one of the worst things that we do to trees. And so when I travel around and I am imagining, and I am a consumer, I drive around and I look at, at these water oaks. And in my mind, I'm thinking, is this normal? It must be. Somebody had pruned these trees. This is normal for how a water oak should appear. And then when I go to pay my gas bill, I look at this island and I look at this crepe myrtle and I have to assume that this is normal. This is a crepe myrtle that wants to grow 25 feet tall, but it can be pruned like this because 
I see it on this commercial establishment. Is that what customers are thinking? Or I go to the post office over to the right of the image and I look at this and I wonder, my gosh, what is happening here? Is this how crepe myrtles need to be pruned? Is this the, the new normal that we pay by the pound or we receive payment by the pound that we, the more we remove, the more, more we get paid? That's ludicrous. But be mindful that customers, clients, people, do-it-yourselfers are looking at this as an example of how pruning needs to be done. And so I say, stop. All right. We cannot allow this to happen. And so way back in the 90s, I remember my neighbor, I have to give you some background on this crepe myrtle. It is a Natchez, it still is. But for five years, I taught my neighbor how to prune this to create the beautiful arcing habit. It's growing at the end of his driveway, at the back of his driveway, actually. Plenty of space for it to grow. So I asked Dennis when I came home, he had borrowed my, my loppers. I asked him, why did you do this? That was his remark. That's how they did it at the mall. And so sadly, my advice of five years was irrelevant because what he saw at the shopping mall is what he felt was appropriate. And as I followed the growth of this, he continued to top that specimen. And then when I look at my own landscape, I try to create a, a vision from my next door neighbor who is an engineer. This crepe myrtle in the foreground is what I feel needs to be done. We use our removal and reduction cuts in order to maintain this, this natural form of this particular tree. But no offense to engineers, but in some cases, an engineer will cut them back at six feet, three inches and cut them all at that particular height. Why? Because that's how everyone else does it. All right. And you've already heard about the crate murder. It continues. And so what I feel, and let's going to play this, let's play this quick game of Wheel of Fortune. When customers see the handiwork of people managing Bradford pairs like this, I feel that we have a failure to blank and blank. Okay. Take 30 seconds to fill in the vowels. I'm not going to give you any, any vowels or consonants. What we've got here is a failure to demonstrate and to educate. When these trees are poorly pruned, and, and I would say that they're whacked, they will, they will collapse. And I hope that, that when we do have these, these failures that there is no damage to people or property. So now let's let's finally get to what Polumsky is going to be talking about. For all of you, as a reminder, I want to mention those ANSI standards. Sadly, I forgot to put the I there and know what the specs are and as well as know what best management practices are. We're also going to review four pruning cuts that are part of the industry protocol. And then let's take a look at some of these techniques. And it's really critical that you may know these responses regarding the techniques you use, but do your customers. They need to understand a response from pruning. And then my call out to all of you, we need to create examples of proper pruning. We need to teach our customers how to do it properly. So either that they do it themselves, of course, it would be great for them to hire you to do the right thing, but they need to know what is the right thing. And so with regard to these ANSI standards, you know what they are, that these are the criteria that we use as professionals. You use these, these standards to also develop these specifications. 
uh, these plans that are used to define the work that you do. And also it enables the client to know what you are doing with regard to your interaction with the shrubs and trees in their landscape. And the one in the middle, of course, those best management practices are a companion guide to those ANSI standards. And so what we have, of course, uh, is the revision 2017 of the ANSI standards for tree shrub and uh, woody plant management. We've got the accompanying best management practices, and we've got just a treasure trove of extremely helpful information that's out there. And in my presentation, I borrowed uh, from Dr. Gilman's book, his Illustrated Guide to Pruning in the third edition, as well as his instructional pruning book. Two wonderful resources. And so with these new standards, the 2017 ANSI pruning standards, it's important that you create objectives. And so these objectives, I've got them listed here. You could review them later, but you have to have this purpose and you need to be able to communicate those objectives to your client. And so prior to doing anything in these landscapes, know why are you there? What is the purpose of your interaction with this tree? What do you aim to do? And so that is essentially the first step is developing that list of, of objectives for pruning these shrubs and trees. Following that, remember the, the four cuts that are listed in those ANSI standards. We have the reduction cut. And this is where we remove a branch to a typically a smaller branch that is of sufficient size in order to uh, maintain that particular space. And so the general rule is a minimum of one third to one half the diameter of the branch that's being removed. And so with this reduction cut, I just love the illustrations that Dr. Gillen had, had uh, provided in his book. And so you could see what this reduction cut looks like with regard to removing that larger branch and allowing that lateral branch to the right to now fill in that particular space. What we're trying to do is maintain that central leader and allow that lateral limb to grow into or to fill up the, the right side of that tree. And so typical example of that, that one third of the lateral that's removed. Take a look at these removal or collar cuts. And these are made right outside the trunk collar. And so they could be branches that, that are right next to the trunk. Or in a case like this, that limb uh, could also be adjacent to a much larger limb. And so the difference between uh, this removal uh, cut here is that the limb that remains, whether it's a trunk or a limb, is typically much larger than the limb that is being removed. So these are two popular cuts. I mentioned the collar region. And if you've attended uh, or participated in a number of webinars and symposia, I mean, we really preach this. I preach this to my students as well, the importance of maintaining that collar region to encourage compartmentalization of decay, to create that seal over the top of that wound that we created with that removal cut. And so respecting that collar when you violate that collar region, you could kill cambial tissue. At the same time, you could encourage decay. And so sadly, when I visit rest stops, obviously uh, one has to stop on these long trips. And sadly, I see a lot of this happening. And why are these standards not implemented? And sadly, when people go to these rest stops like me, Maybe they do look at these trees and wonder, is this normal? And of course it's not. Years ago, we had 
research has proven that these flush cuts are deleterious to the health of these of our trees. And so you can see with these flush cuts that you you encourage adventitious shoot formation where you've got shoots, buds developing from callus tissue. In some cases, you release uh, ad, uh, release latent buds. And then you've got this whole flurry of, of buds emanating from these wounds. And of course, with the asphalt emulsion over the top, no, we should not be doing this. Really, with these, your customers, maybe you don't need to tell them about what happens inside that collar region, about this branch protection zone that contains phenols, chemical compounds that prevent fungal invasion, but also the fact that that cambium is able, able to produce callus, wound wood and then callus tissue to seal that wound. But it's important to let the clients know that your cuts will be made, those removal cuts will be made outside of the branch collar. That is a really important tool when we're interested in the longevity of our shrubs and trees. Another cut is the heading cut. And this is actually a cut where you do make it above a node or above a bud. And so another example from Gilman as well, that what we do with the heading cut is to encourage branching beneath the pruning cut. But remember again, unlike topping, which is the indiscriminate removal of wood, here the heading cuts are made above a node. And so a typical uh, example of a heading cut is pollarding. And so when you travel through Europe, you will see a number of pollarded London plane trees, a whole assortment of, of uh, even uh, linden trees or lime trees, uh, these London plains as well in Germany. This is, these are a series of heading cuts. When we look at ginkgo biloba, we can see these large knobs of tissue, these knuckles that are full of carbohydrate. And by repeatedly cutting back those, heading back those shoots, we create these large knuckles. And then from those knuckles, we have the emergence of new shoots. There are a number of trees that are, are excellent for pollarding. Crape myrtle has been suggested. I, I attended a meeting uh, that was uh, where uh, Dr. Gimmel was a speaker, and he recommended the importance of pollarding for crape myrtle. If we're interested in the survival of crape myrtle, which we are, instead of topping, indiscriminately removing wood, cut back those shoots year after year and create these large knuckles. I, I admit it's, it's a, an aesthetic issue uh, when, I, when I consider pollarding, I'm not a big fan of it, but if you have people for whatever reason who desire to reduce the height of that crown, pollarding is an effective tool. And so doing a little comparison here between polarity and topping, we have all of these positive advantages. Don't have the time to go over this, but with polarity, this is an annual pruning event. And we're talking about removing the small diameter wood rather than in topping, where regardless of the age of the wood, you are, rem you are removing large portions that, re that also result in large wounds that result from that process. And so continuing with regard to the pollarding process, it does encourage tree longevity. With regard to the structure, yeah, I just have a real tough time appreciating it, but I know the folks in California, many of them really love that look. But I would tell you from a longevity and, and, and health standpoint, pollarding is the way to go. Topping, which requires no thought, can actually lead to the death of trees. And many of you have seen that happen. I've seen trees after six months of topping, they die, especially when this topping has been done in the middle of the growing season. And then finally, our last cut is the shearing cut. This is a cut that everybody can do, all right? So regardless of how tall you are, or how short you are, you prune, you, I mean, sorry, you shear these, these shrubs at this predetermined height. 
and that's relatively easy to do. I highly recommend that you don't use a string trimmer. There are a number of companies out there, for whatever reason, they choose to use string trimmers. In some cases, depending on the species, these string trimmers do not cut the wood cleanly, which is a requirement of proper pruning. Now, with something like this, this is a great do-it-yourselfer. I don't get it. I'm more into the informal approach to things, but with the appropriate timing, where these flower buds are produced in the, in the late summer of the previous year, you can have some really interesting donuts. And so just a few of these shots, yes, they do draw attention. Laura Pedlum's wonderful specimen for shearing. And so I guess that might be a variation of a toadstool or, or a gumdrop on a stick, I don't know. But there are, a, there are a number of species that when you prune them at the appropriate time of year, so you don't remove their flower buds, they will do beautifully. And so when I think about this whole shearing effect, it is strictly for formal landscapes. And I don't know, maybe in this neighborhood, this person had gone to Versailles and they came back to the U.S. and said, you know, I want to have my own little miniature Versailles here. Fine. But when I look at that, I really feel that this is a good job for a professional to be managing shearing the shrubs into these formal looking shapes. And of course, I mentioned there are some species that do exceptionally well. And there's a reason when you create this maze in St. Augustine, Florida with Chinese podocarpus. I don't know why, but maybe this is, yeah, this is an espalier of Chinese podocarpus done exceptionally well. And so I want you to understand here that there are shrubs that lend themselves to shearing. There are shrees, something between a shrub and a tree, like podocarpus, like osmanthus, like laura petalum. They tolerate shearing as well. They could also be limbed up to be trees. And so now let's take a look at this. Here's now we're going to run into some issues. I really feel that it's important to look at the shrubs that you have planted at the foundation. And if it's going to be a shrub that will grow 12 feet tall, why are you pruning it at a height of perhaps two feet here? And you're doing it constantly. Now, I understand from a business standpoint, this would be the home that I would love to manage. But realistically, it just seems ludicrous that you have to use pruning to keep these trees in check. I'm sorry, these shrubs in check. Right across the street, because perhaps of the effort and cost involved in maintaining a shrub that wants to grow 12 feet tall in a two foot space, these people limit their gardening to these little two containers on the front porch. By the way, that is my son. I kind of dragged him around the neighborhood as I took pictures. No, what's wrong with informal or this natural pruning approach? Now, I am a fan of this. And of course, Dr. Michael Durr, this is his one of his earlier homes coming out of his foundation planting. When I look at these shrubs here, you can thin out individual branches to maintain that natural form. Not everything that is a shrub has to be sheared. And what really gets really sad about this is when I look at this, this uh, island planting, everything in that planting has been sheared. Our crepe myrtles, our heavenly bamboo, and on the outside are Yopon hollies. Your customers need to know what happens when you shear. In shearing, you create, you make these, these heading cuts and you create this flourish of new growth on the outer margins of those shrubs. Look at the interior. Look at those bare stems. All of the, 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 the shell of foliage on the outside now needs to support the growth beneath that shell. I've seen Japanese hollies, azaleas fail after a period of time, and my hunch is due to starvation. Uh, with regard to boxwood pruning or shearing, that's commonly done as well. Lynn Batdorf, who wrote the beautiful book on, on boxwood uh, culture, recommended thinning to improve sunlight penetration. Of course, remember the width, the, the, the bottom of the, of the hedge being wider than the top is important for light distribution, but you have to remember light penetration. 
Also, be mindful of the species. Raphaelepis, Indian hawthorn, what is it susceptible to? What is its Achilles heel, a disease that defoliates it? You're kind of quiet out there. Okay, Enemasporium leaf spot. You've seen this. We do have resistant cultivars. But when you repeatedly shear Raphaelepis, the new growth is highly susceptible to Enemasporium leaf spot. The mature leaves are not. But when you see disease, the knee-jerk reaction of a do-it-yourselfer is to get rid of it by pruning it. You ultimately end up killing that shrub. This is the middle of summer, and this person eventually got rid of it. Remember the old red tips? Achilles heel is uh, that red tip, is uh, enemasporium leaf spot, and it begins with those initial spots on the new growth, and then with continued leaf infections on the newly emerged leaves, it results in defoliation. And so going into December, we need to be seeing foliage on our evergreens, but you will not. A couple of other uh, situations that arise from shearing. Have you seen reversion? I've seen it on Burford holly, on Carissa holly. A reversion back to the Chinese horn holly. When you shear these plants hard, when you renew them or rejuvenate them by cutting uh, close to soil level, you can encourage a reversion. A Carissa holly has reverted in this space right here. And so ultimately over time, you end up having a Chinese horn holly rather than the Carissa with that single point at the tip of the leaf. I've seen this happen with our Laura Petalums, reverting back to the green form. I've just recently seen this with Sunshine Ligustrum, shearing it, pruning it hard, and we see this reversion back to green. And so when I talk about shearing, when you talk to your customers about shearing, you do not encourage them to shear trees. And I've seen this sweet gum, a very good compartmentalizer. This should not be done. We need to be mindful of the response that we get when we shear these plants. So there's a close-up of what these, these, sorry, these topped branches look like. This Medusa look of all of these explosions of epicormic sprouts that are loosely attached, but also are leaving large wounds. My greatest concern, my friends, this is in the vicinity of targets of people, of vehicles, this tree can fail with this poor type of pruning. Sadly, there are customers that ask for the re reduction in height of those trees, and instead of an arborist doing a crown reduction, this they do the simple way out and prune by the pound. They go ahead and remove at an, at an arbitrary height all of the growth above that particular height that they had in mind. This is unconscionable, and this is not a demonstration of good pruning. And so you have to convince your customers that this is evil. Oh, yeah, sorry. This is not good. Right. And so when I look at this, we also, it's important for, for the customers to understand, okay, so what happens next? This is what you need to con confer to them in the development of those objectives, and they need to be mindful of the response. Is this what happens? Are these the people that do this stuff? No, but when I look at these responses, this is unacceptable. This is not an, anymore the informal habit of, of this particular Bradford pear with these this explosion of epicormic sprouts, these poorly attached limbs, these, stru these the structural uh, um, lack of integrity of those co-dominant trunks. This makes no sense. And so when a customer does not know what is right, they will pay for this kind of work. And as professionals, we should not allow that to happen. And going back to a variation of Newton's third law of physics, where you have to be mindful that for every pruning action, 
we do get a response. And in this case, like this with the Bradford, this is a common practice in my neck of the woods. And instead of employing reduction cuts, removal cuts, simply it was topped. And we have all of these issues internally that eventually may cause this tree to collapse. And so, as I said, what cuts do we want to put on? What would, would we want to employ the reduction and the removal cuts? Okay, so I'm getting really stoked about this stuff. Let me just calm down for a moment and let's just review this. This is something that's also of importance to your customers. They need to know when is an appropriate time to do pruning that involves the removal of a lot of wood. And so what we would like to see ideally right before that spring growth flush. I understand in the business pruning has to be done and spread out over the fall and winter months. But when we look at this ideal time, we would like to catch it right before, right at, at, at bud swell, right before new growth, new growth occurs. Of course, whenever you see any dead, dying, damaged limbs, diseased limbs, they should be removed at any time of the year. Customers need to be mindful as that, of that as well. When they see a hanger, when they see limbs that have failed and are dying or are dead, you need to come to the rescue and need to take action. And so this is good for you to know, perhaps even for your customers to understand about the being the best time is this is where the tree will marshal its resources and, and, and employ the compartmentalization process in order to seal that wound to avoid fungal and disease infestations. When it comes to shrubs, this is a critical rule as well, that if these shrubs of the flower before the 1st of June, they, let's see, before the 1st of June, uh, it's important that you prune them after they have flowered. Those that bloom after the 1st have pr produced flowers on current season's growth. And so these are the ones that in the winter time, in addition to pruning trees that require maybe some structural pruning, you could also prune these summer flowering shrubs. Now, granted, there are some exceptions like oak leaf hydrangea, which produces flowers on last year's wood. Of course, there are those, there are those exceptions. And so when I look at, at issues like this with Forsythia producing flowers in, in the late summer of the previous year, Pruning occurs in the fall to shape it up as we go into winter. And then this is what you get. This is unacceptable if it is done by a professional. This is a friend of mine. Even though I've counseled him, he really likes that very neat looking look. Or a situation like this with Raphaelepis. You come in here in the fall with this evergreen and you go ahead and choose to prune in the fall. In some cases, you can't have and, and you can encourage new growth, which cough often gets killed by freezing temperatures. But at other times, there is no response in the latter part of fall. So what your client gets to see is all of these cut stems. This is an embarrassment. It's also a total disrespect, I feel, for our profession. This is unacceptable. And so as I close this 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 really rapidly presented pruning talk, it's important that when you do develop your, your objectives that, of course, you identify and assess the plants that are in question. Be mindful of the species and cultivar, whether it's a, a uh, large maturing specimen or a dwarf cultivar, that's really important. When you visit a client's property and there's a foster number two holly on the corner, Burford holly to the right, I think it would behoove you to let the client know that why are you continually suppressing the height of a foster number two that wants to grow over 25 feet tall in that small space there? The same thing with regard to the Burford hollies. These are not dwarf Burfords. Why not replace them with a species that would be more appropriate for that space? 
So all of that really plays into writing a, appropriate uh, objectives and specifications and letting the client know what needs to be done. The other thing that's really important as well is for the client to understand that this is not normal. My friend John Ellsley chose to pose in, in, in front of these topped crepe myrtles. And so when we look at this, we see a number of removal cuts, but sadly it was topped. And when you look at the response, there's no attractive feature here. We're not, we're not harvesting those twigs to make fences or burning them for kindling. And say, oops, let's move along from that one. Or my neighbor with his mulberry, a specimen that's perfect for pilarding. And so when you look at this process, this is what he has in, in 2014. And now in 2016, he asked me, well, now, Bob, it's time to prune this one again. Really? Topping is not the way to go. If you want to reduce the height on these, use crown reduction techniques in order to reduce their height. And so let me close with this. This is clever. I visited the Grand Ole Opry a long time ago when we used to have film in our cameras, slide film. And so one morning I walked out of the Grand Ole Opry and I looked at all these wonderful Southern magnolias. So immediately I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. They, they sheared all of these magnolias in order to create these lollipops maybe. I mean, it's a very formal entryway. But what they did here, if you could see, it's like this giant hair net. It actually looks like the net that you use to, to prevent birds from uh, consuming your blueberries or other fruits. Isn't that so clever? It's entirely enclosed in this netting to create the illusion that somebody spent hours and lots of dollars on pruning these crowns. And what's so clever, and this is American ingenuity, my friends, those older leaves have sloughed off and so you simply open up the bottom of the net and you collect those leaves. It can't be any more elegant than that. So once again, reminding you that pruning, removing wood is not always a necessary option. And so I really feel that as an industry, quality should always be number one. And we have to use knowledge in conducting these pruning practices, but also I really feel it's important that we share that information with our customers as well. So I, I, I challenged you to say out loud with your team alone that yes, you are a lifelong learner, but yes, I am an educator. That is, I feel, one of our roles. And so I love this, this, this Chinese proverb, and I know it's addressed toward planting, but I just love this last line here, that if you are planting, if you're pruning, if you're managing trees, educate people. And so my friends, as I close out here, yes, trees are the guardians of the earth, but we are the guardians of the trees. And so I want to thank you so much for your attention. And I'd be happy if there is time for us to uh, address uh, any, any of your comments or questions regarding this, this presentation. And I'd like to toss it back to Dr. Panisi. Thank you, Bob. Um, I have rarely heard someone speak on the subject with such passion, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that uh, you could join us and open on such a high note uh, our webinar series for 2019. Uh, this is a topic that is certainly not only very important, uh, but it's one that, as you said, um, there are more examples of how it's not done right than it is in how it's done well or correctly. Um, while we're waiting for people to come up with questions, and I will give those to you as they come in, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how would you approach with three tips, three like regular tips, someone who, just like that lady, was climbing on the ladder 
to trim, to prune those bushes in front of her house. The three things that a landscaper who wants to educate that lady um, could uh, convert her into one of the, if you say the, the believers into the tree health or shrub health. Okay, that's, that's a wonderful question. I appreciate your kind words, Dr. Finisi. I, well, the, for the first thing I would say for my, my, uh, my, my friend, my neighbor's safety is that she needs to keep both feet on the ground. That any time any shrub tree requires a ladder, I really feel for anyone's safety who, who is not a professional, who doesn't do this on a regular basis, doesn't have the training, should keep both feet on the ground. The other thing I, I feel that would be important is and when I'm telling you this, uh, Dr. Padisi, I feel like I'm also I'm, I'm confessing that I really feel that this spring I need to talk to her because I know she's going to bring out the ladder again. Um, I feel, too, that it's important for me to identify these species for her and just to let her know that these species want to grow fairly tall and that maybe what she needs to do, she had removed that Indian hawthorn because it was defoliated in the middle of summer. She really should consider either doing it herself or having someone remove these plants, prune these plants at soil level and put in species, cultivars that are appropriate for that space. The third option would be is to give her this option. Okay, she cannot perhaps afford to replace those plants, but she would have to then understand this is what regimen is necessary, that if you choose to keep these plants away from your siding, hopefully they're not in front of any foundation vents, you have to regularly prune them, reduce your fertilization to manage any vegetative growth, and just try to keep them contained in that space. Uh, my friend does have to make some very hard decisions, but as I drive around, people inherit these plants from um, from people that have previously owned the home and somebody has to either put a stop to it and start all over and renovate that landscape or deal with what you have but understand what has to be done the responses that will occur and knowing that if you keep these plants like cinderella and her her her, her uh, stepsisters you can't stick a size 12 foot into a six a size six glass slipper it's not going to happen and it's not going to happen for a foster number two to grow 20 feet tall in that in that space it loses its identity great thank you so much um we have two uh, questions and they're very quickly answered. Um, please show the John Ruskin quote again on quality or just state it. Okay, is that something that I could do on my computer? Uh, if you just go back to that slide. And the other one is also show the four T's um, because okay. people thought that it was thought timing tools. <laughs> And okay, I'd be happy else. to show that as well. And I was just wondering, Dr. Panisi, I don't know what, what your pro, how you, you uh, manage this program. I, I just love the webinars you had last year. Um, I love to be able to share this PowerPoint with 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 your audience. Uh, there are some items I would like to remove, but I would just really like to be able to share this with with your viewers, if that's possible. It is possible. All you have to do is is provide us with a PDF file after um, you remove the ones that you do not want to include. Again, the <laughs> live webinar is one thing, but we also have an archive. So that archive is available online so people can uh, watch and listen to you. But if you want them to have a PDF file, we can um, also uh, post it um, on that website too. Super. So here, here's what we've got with that, with that quality quote. And I just love the connection between intelligence and the importance that it does require an effort to do the right thing. And let me just see if I could now go to quickly spool through here to show you the four T's is what I have mentioned a lot in the past. And this works really well uh, with, with people that are new to pruning when I try to teach them about managing the, their plants in their own landscape, uh, it has been pretty powerful uh, to share those points with them. 
and let me just see. And so this is essentially just a lead in. Okay, let's see. Mm. And if, uh, here we go. Okay. And so the techniques, of course, if we could steer people away from shearing everything, being mindful of the other three cuts that are available and knowing what are we trying to do. And so I will tell you admittedly that it's very difficult to, for people to envision when they see a foster number two or even looking at this mulberry in the lower right hand corner, what do I wanna see with this tree? Well, ultimately I want to reduce its height, but they need to understand that that is not a normal mulberry when you just remove or top all of those shoots. They need to have the vision of what a mulberry tree should look like. And it's up to the arbors to be able to communicate that with them, to let them know that they could reduce that crown by making appropriate removal and reduction cuts to find another central leader that could dominate that canopy. And so that is that technique that's critical for them to know. And with regard to the tools, of course, using sharp tools, knowing that uh, you, that for large, over over three quarter inch material, you want to use loppers. You don't want to use those bypass pruning shears. Making sure the importance of of cutting cleanly to encourage rapid healing, and that leads us to the timing aspects as well. When we, when we think about wanting to reduce the heights of plants dramatically, I, I failed to mention, but with broadleaf evergreens, they tolerate rejuvenation very well, where you, where you cut them back really hard. But remember that when they re-sprout, you have to come back with removal and reduction cuts to thin out a lot of those sprouts that had developed. And so I really feel that we can teach customers uh, and they will pay for your service, which I feel should be not only doing a particular task, a particular uh, activity like that, but also teaching them so they know what to expect when you interact with that tree and knowing as well that there's a possibility that as a result of this response, you may have to come back and it may take you some time, like in a situation this mulberry, in order to return it back to its informal crown will require repeated visits from an arborist who is knowledgeable. Hey, Bob, uh, yes. we could hear you just fine, but for some reason your screen is not visible. Um, is it possible that you jumped out of the screen view mode? Oh, okay, let me see. I can't believe that. <laughs> oh, what, 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 let me do uh, my main screen. Show my screen. Yes, there we go. Yeah, so if you can just go to, <laughs> yeah, we heard you just fine, so that's good. Yeah, there you go, just right there. The I'm technique. sorry, I had no idea. Well, Dr. Panisi, I, I've really had a wonderful time here uh, sharing this information. And what I would love, uh, I don't know, hopefully it'll be in my lifetime that as I drive throughout the Southeast, I see these wonderful demonstrations of excellence. And that when people go to rest stops from North Carolina to Georgia to wherever, and they do look at these beautifully pruned trees and they'll realize, hey, I need to do this at home. I need to find somebody who could do this in my landscape. That would be a dream that I hope will be fulfilled in my lifetime. You and me, my friend, I share your dream <laughs> and, and uh, I absolutely think that we, we owe it to um, the industry, to horticulture, to our clientele, but I feel mostly for the plants. <laughs> I oh, feel gosh. like we really uh, have abused these wonderful creations and we owe it to them to show and share their beauty. 
uh, with with the rest of the world. And also as we have our children and talk to them about nature and plants and animals, we can tell them how to appreciate uh, and really train them to see the right way of caring for plants and that um, n that's not necessarily that what you see everywhere is what is the right way of the plant uh, or the natural way that plant or a shrub tree develops and grows. Uh, one of the things that I have really felt strongly about is um, polarding and the uh, potential of that technique to uh, be more widely used, especially for crepe myrtles. Um, so th could you talk a little bit, maybe show some of your slides on polarding again? We have some okay. time, by the way. Well, very minutes. good. And uh, I just I just hope that we're going to be okay with, doctor, with regard to Dr. Taylor. Um, I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, we're fine. At 9.30, we take five minutes of break, so we're good. We have four minutes more. So if you can okay. go to that slide when, on a poll. Oh, okay, oh, there, there we go. Okay, so let me just go back into here. And I'm really happy that, that you mentioned the polarding. Uh, and that was something can that. Can you go ahead uh, and, and do your screen again? Uh, oh, Richie, sorry. I think that uh, you're jumping in on, on another slide. Yeah. Bob, if you can yeah. just go ahead and. and uh, and accept that pop-up message. So Show that my you screen. Your screen again. Do you see it? Um, yes, I sure do. I sure do. Do you see it? Okay, so let, let's go ahead, and this 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 is good, right over here. Uh, and so I remember when Dr. Gilman had mentioned this, it just seemed, you know, why didn't I get this idea where when we have the crepe myrtle in the middle, of course, has, I'm not sure if it, yeah, it had been, there have been a number of uh, removal cuts in the interior, but what we do with regard to wanting to reduce its height for whatever reason, perhaps, I guess these power lines, I don't remember in Columbia, if these power lines interfere with that canopy, but you take these long wispy shoots and you cut them back to, I like to see them back to maybe a half inch to an inch in height. And I'm hoping that we take a look at this one here. And so when you cut them back, I would probably want to, I would probably want to cut them back. Maybe, well, see, I see a node there, or that looks like a uh, a potential latent bud, but just to make these cuts close to the crown. And so you can see in the upper right here, these are the, the, the sizes of the wounds that we are creating uh, by polarding. And when you do this, this is an annual event. And so what's wonderful about this is that you have to come back annually, but you're cutting back small wood and you're also creating callus tissue and this accumulation of carbohydrate that results in this large knuckle or knob. And I've seen a number of crepe myrtles and I'm, I'm, I'm sure our audience has seen that as well. When you create, if you remove this large knuckle, you would create this large wound, and I've seen crepe myrtles dying back down to the ground. And you lose all of that trunk as a result of creating that large wound where the cambial tissue had been killed and perhaps fungi had attacked it and it had failed. And so with, with polarding, I still find it a little, it's, a, it's, it's not my taste, but if I'm, I know I'm interested in the health of these crepe myrtles, I want them to survive. This is an alternative to willy-nilly just removing the tops and creating broomsticks uh, out of those trunks. And so with Polarding, if you could take a look at Dr. Gilman's book, also take a look at uh, the University of Florida website that, that, that uh, Dr. Gilman is managing. A lot of wonderful slides with regard to Polarding and how, how one goes about doing that process. All right, well, it's 9.30. And again, thank you, Dr. Polomsky, for joining uh, us with us this morning and sharing your expertise and passion for pruning. I think we all can appreciate uh, the importance of the subject and uh, uh, you have certainly given us a lot of food for thought. Thank you again. And we're uh, up for five minute break. Thank you so much, Dr. Finisi.